Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is the American Muslim Experience, and we are here with episode 97. Super excited today. We have, of course, Barbez Ahmed. Hey, how are you guys? Um, uh, welcome back, uh, listeners, and uh, thank you for joining us as always. Um, how are you doing, Omar? Um, I, I know we, we use this as an opportunity to catch up, uh, kind of lightweight catch up. How, how are things? Doing good, doing good, alhamdulillah. Just uh, kind of getting through summer. Kids' school has started. Um, yeah. A little craziness in the world. The, the, some of the stress stressors aren't going away, right, with the, all that's going on, the fires in California. I'm not in California, but, of course, my, my house is and people I care about are. Um, so, yeah, that's happening and yeah. hearing more and more about the election. So it feels like the, the stressors are piling on, but, you know, just making the most of it and yeah. finding a little joys in life uh, to, to keep, keep, uh, keep, keep life uh, nice, relaxing and as stress-free as possible. As possible. You know, just, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. just going on a lot of walks and watching uh, Batman trailers, I guess. <laughs> You are you are you are situating our show properly. Um, we are yes, we are recording while we've got these uh, uh, really crazy um, lightning fires, uh, com- lightning complex fires going on all over the state. Um, one a few minutes from my house, but uh, we are safe, alhamdulillah. Uh, and yeah, like you said, just trying to keep s- sane, uh, juggling all the uh, various stressors in life in general. Let alone during this kind of uh, you know, obviously with the. Uh, Pardon the expression, hellscape that 2020 has has uh, has turned into. But uh, yeah, um, and it's uh, it's timely that we also are talking about stressors and and, and dealing with stress because uh, of the person we're going to be speaking with today, Omar. Yeah, Doctor Amr Rahimullah. Uh, we're really happy to have uh, Amr on, on the show. Uh, we've known Amr, uh, of course, um, outside of work for quite some time as well. But uh, I myself didn't know about all the really interesting area of expertise that he dabbles in. Amir is a clinical consultant at Lucid Lane, uh, which is a a startup he'll be talking about, very relevant to the topic at hand uh, today, which is addiction. Uh, And Dr. Amir Rahimullah is a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine and director of the Addiction Medicine Consultant Service at Stanford Hospital. So we're going to be talking a lot about addiction as expertise today. Uh, given all the stressors that are happening in the world right now. Uh, Amr is board certified in addiction medicine, internal medicine, and he completed his training at Stanford University School of Medicine and his internal medicine training at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Uh, So as I said, his specialization is opioid and benzodiazepine. I don't even know how to say that. Uh, Tapers. Amr, you're going to have to educate us on on the right pronunciation. It's it's fine. None none of us know how to say it. Uh, We call call them benzos. (laughs) Okay. Benzos and treating substance use disorders in residential and outpatient programs, as well as inpatient and office-based settings. So Amr, welcome. Super interesting to talk about this. Very important. Although um, under, you know, not as much talked about topic. So really important and uh, interesting to dive into that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> Omer uh, touched on this or alluded to this. Uh, excuse me. Um, uh, we obviously know you personally. Uh, you know, beyond just having you on the show. Full disclosure: Omer is my cousin, um, and I think Omer, you've got an interesting sort of link to Omer as well, right? Your brother-in-law and Omer went to right, school yeah. together or medical school. Yeah, together. they went to med school together. That's right. My brother-in-law they went to med school together, and and. Uh, uh, we live. We all live in the Bay Area, of course, right. uh, which is t- tends to happen with this show. But uh, uh, yeah, of course, you know, my, I live right across the bridge from Stanford, and, and Amr works at Stanford. So, but but again, really interesting. Really interested to dive into some of these talks. I didn't even. I don't even. I didn't even know all these things about Amr. So, um, yeah, I'm Amr really has- fascinated. Yeah, for sure, for sure, absolutely. And and as we often like to do, Amir, um, you know, I guess tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you know, obviously we 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 heard University of Illinois being mentioned there. Um, uh, you are originally from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about your background, and then we can get into um, your professional life. Sure, absolutely. So. Um, so, you know, born and raised in the Chicagoland area, we moved out here a couple of years ago to the Bay Area, California, to pursue some extra training in addiction medicine and started working at Stanford 
you know, loved the weather and the work I was doing out here. And I stayed on to launch an addiction consult service at Stanford Hospital. Addiction consult services are a uh, way of intervening and increasing access to addiction treatment in the hospital setting. So, for example, you know, we have a drug overdose epidemic. You'll have things like drug courts because people with addictions commonly get arrested for things or have run-ins with the law. So they'll have drug courts where they'll have um, treatment associated with these, uh, you know, felonies or, or, or charges that people get. So it's this, it's this concept of intervening where there's a large population of drug addicts and people with alcohol problems. Same thing with the hospital. People with addictions also have a higher prevalence of a higher incidence of hospitalization. So by intervening at the hospital level, we're able to intervene on a large concentrated population of people with addiction. So we, we go in and we talk to people in the hospital who have a medical consequence of their addiction. And this is, you know, crystal meth, heroin, alcohol, cannabis issues as well. So psychiatric complications of their addiction uh, or medical complications of their addiction. And they're really in a more reachable and teachable moment, just like, you know, after they have a legal consequence with the drug courts, they're in a much more reachable and teachable moment. So in the hospital, we come in and we'll do a brief intervention, get their family involved, get them started on treatment therapy, medications, and then link them to ongoing treatment. So it's a really new kind of model, but it's being um, rapidly increasing all over the country to address so it. It's, it's the idea of they're at a, they've kind of hit this low and you're trying to, trying to leverage that low point to, and, and to make into a turnaround moment, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of our patients are just going on about their business. Some of them have been thinking about stopping drugs and alcohol for some time. Others, not even a thought. But once they come to the hospital, their lives are such somewhat disrupted. And now they are in the hospital, away from drugs and alcohol, minds clearing up a little bit, and in some sort of pain and suffering from their medical consequence. So now they're a little bit more teachable, reachable, frustrated, sick and tired of being sick and tired, then we come in, enter us, and we start to have a real collaborative uh, patient-centered discussion and go from there. I, I had a you – know, I just wanted to ask one relevant question before we get too too much into into the, the, the specifics because I'm curious how someone from a you – know, Thank you. That was my question. Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. How, how does some – you know, typically – Chicago uh, Muslim Americans like like yourself end up as uh, you know fa- internal medicine family doctors whatever. How, how do you, how did you get into an area that maybe is t- I don't want to say taboo but not spoken of uh, so definitely in the Muslim community right? And we'll get into that too about the idea of it, it not being talked about. But how, how did you how did you find this area and how did how did it uh, you know connect with you? That's a good question. So. You know, I got a lot of reasons why I got into this field, you know, uh, and one sort of reason that may sort of translate more broadly is uh, I remember when I was in undergrad uh, and uh, before medical school and really looking at volunteer options because you have to volunteer in order to get into medical school. It's something that people pursuing medical school do to, you know, increase their, their chances, their resume, so on and so forth. So, you know, I had a, uh, a choices of where to volunteer. One of the places I wanted to volunteer at was a soup kitchen. It just felt like something that was in line with the Sunnah and something that was like a Muslim thing to do. And so, and I was interested in poverty and and, you know, my thoughts of what a soup kitchen would look like uh, was different than what it actually was when I when I got there. So when I, you know, I had this idea of a soup kitchen, you know, me like ladling soup to really malnourished, poor, grateful people getting soup. And, you know, when I got there, it wasn't it wasn't like that. So, you know, when I got there, first of all, there wasn't any soup. It was just like regular food. And uh, it wasn't malnourished people 
And poverty in America is very different than poverty in other countries. And I started to realize that a lot of the people that I was dealing with had mental illness or an addiction. And our poverty looks different than poverty in other places. One of the interesting things that I saw that I I started to look into after this, because this started to raise a lot of questions in my mind. One of the interesting things that came up was, as I looked into this more, is um, in affluent countries, poor people are generally more affected by obesity. Whereas in poor countries, it's more so the affluent people that are affected by obesity. Just looking at the global opioid, I'm sorry, global obesity problem. And, uh, you know, it started to get me a little curious and, uh, you know, things weren't as intuitive as I thought. And just looking at the fundamental and core issues, the root problem issues in terms of poverty led me to thinking about addiction a little bit more seriously. Also, just as I was doing my internal medicine rotation, I'm sorry, my residency, I realized that we have an opioid problem and we are, as physicians, have a large part to play in propagating that and also helping that. So physicians are on the front lines of turning this around and helping the opioid epidemic. Uh, and uh, and they have a they have a lot that they can do to to help turn the opioid epidemic around. You know, and there's a lot of other reasons as well. Just kind of seeing addiction uh, and uh, the problems that it brings. Um, so 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 it, like I imagine programs such as the one here at Stanford that specialize in addiction. Uh, medicine are probably not as prevalent um, countrywide. Would you, would you agree with that assessment? So is that one of the reasons that drew, drew you to, to the program at Stanford in particular? You know, I was looking at a lot of places, and yes, it's not very common to have robust addiction treatment programs within uh, medicine or medical departments. Uh, so especially this model, the addiction consult service model, it's not uh, common in some areas, usually common in places that are really hit hard by the opioid epidemic, uh, but not as common. It's a growing phenomenon, but uh, yes, that's definitely what drew me uh, to Stanford, so, is that they did have a great program. And, and if I recall, I mean, even the program at, at, at Stanford that you are now a part of, was something that was sort of in development or was being developed or was developed after you completed your um, your fellowship or your training? Yeah, so there was not a consult service. Yeah. We, we drew up a proposal and we kind of got uh, some buy-in from leadership. Uh, we showed that this works in reducing readmissions and then reducing addiction severity and helps people do better. Uh, so it had an evidence base behind it. It wasn't just a thought. It had s- some statistics and some proof behind its efficacy. So we brought that to leadership. We had a lot of great support. We came up with a business model and trialed it. And the first year went really well and it's grown. And second year went well and it's continued to grow since then. And now we have a team of psychiatrists, physicians, therapists, a social worker. We have a drug counselor. We just received a $50,000 grant uh, this past week to focus on the emergency department and uh, hire a a, a drug counselor to to just focus on the emergency department at Stanford Hospital. We have also peer mentors. Peer mentors are people with lived experience and with addiction and have recovered and are able to really build rapport and resonate pe- with people with addiction much much faster than a physician who doesn't have that lived experience. So really, really grown since then and fast too. So there's definitely a need for this type of work. You know, it's interesting. You talk about the, um, the poor, you, you alluded to the poor and versus the rich and, and the different effects of, of really on, on obesity. But I think a Stanford is like the ultimate, the ultimate, um, 
privileged place, right? We know Palo Alto is a very, very, very wealthy place. The Bay Area is wealthy. And I guess the preconceived notion that maybe some people have is that, oh, you're not going to have a lot of a lot of problems of those type at Stanford, right? Or in the area. And why would they need a, a school there? Maybe maybe they just got funding and that's why. But maybe you could help us break some of those those myths about addiction in the, the the privileged class versus the underprivileged class you know you why is it not on the east <laughs> on the east bay uh and so forth you know that, that's not just a funding issue uh in terms of stanford absolutely so that's a great point so first off addiction does not discriminate really uh, fascinating so I, I think starting in the world of addiction treatment it's something that we know but i you know as the more experience we accrue, it just gets deeper and deeper at how addiction just does not discriminate based on socioeconomic background, based on race, culture, religion, anything. So it's it's really a problem of access to substances, drugs and alcohol, and it's a problem of uh, just looking at the risk factor that makes somebody more prone to developing an addiction, mental health, and and all, also having access to mental health care, uh, and then access to substances, and then also other determinants of health, like health literacy, so on and so forth. And so it, it's, it's at Stanford, at Palo Alto, we do have a, a large homeless population coming from East Palo Alto and other areas. Uh, but, um, you know, what I've seen in my work in different settings is that we see anyone from the high-powered executive, high-functioning executive to, to working with the homeless, to working with, you know, uh, middle-class, um, you know, workers, uh, you know, blue-collar workers, and, and also all different ethnicities. So, for example, the opiate epidemic is often looked at as a problem of white rural America, but that's not necessarily true in all areas. So, for example, in Chicago, on the west and south sides of Chicago, with the opioid overdose epidemic, black communities are disproportionately affected by opiate, the opioid epidemic and in other communities as well. But just kind of labeling it as a white rural problem is 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 true there, there it is in many states more so a white rural problem and also something that's probably more helpful for marketing getting advocacy for yeah the opioid epidemic I, i'm really glad you unfortunately. yeah I, I'm, yeah very much so unfortunately um but i'm glad you kind of uh spotlighted that or drew attention to that because i think that um and i don't want to get too much into the politics of this all uh, of this but um you know, uh, the, the, the the last point you made about the opioid crisis being largely seen as a white rural prop problem uh, is one of the arguments that people used, or not arguments, but, but one of the things that people call attention to because, you know, drug addiction as a aggregate um, uh, or as a, um, a, on a macro level has ravaged uh, communities of color disproportionately um, through the 90s, um, you know, with the crack epidemic, uh, epidemic in the inner cities, that was largely a uh, a, a, a drug uh, problem or a drug issue that, uh, as I said, disproportionately ravaged, um, you know, communities of color and the black community in particular. Uh, whereas, and, and we didn't see a lot of, I guess, like you said, advocacy uh, and certainly conversations happening um, vis-a-vis politics or policy, uh, as we began seeing once the opioid crisis, which is more recent than that, right? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, and I'd love for you to talk maybe a little bit about the history of, of, of where or, or, or when the sort of opioid crisis really kind of hits the crescendo where, you know, again, people in positions of power begin to notice um, but I would even argue that even back in the 80s, um, you know, I mean, conversely speaking, you know, the, uh, the drug of choice may have been cocaine, right? And, and, and that was mostly and predominantly a white drug, uh, unlike crack, uh, which comes later. And so, again, race and 
uh, class and drug addiction, addiction seem to be really, uh, you know, interjoined in this conversation. And it might help to talk about kind of an example. And there, I know there's a diversity in terms of all the, the patients you see. It's not, you can't really label them, but, you know, in our mind, Kids, you know, kids are kids who grew up in the 70s, 80s. Crack cocaine was something like Barbez alluded to. You saw like the gang, right? And so on and so forth. And we know that, like you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, you're talking about executives. So maybe you can help us understand what is what does that look like? How do you go from, for example, family man executive peak of your career and end up in the situation where they need uh, care? Like how does, is that like a multi-year process? Is that like... Is, is there a trigger? Is, is there a gateway drug? Is there like a tragedy that like, maybe you can help me understand because the way we understand, for example, street drugs is, you know, and this may be wrong too, but you, you, 15 year old gets handed a something and then that just grows and grows. Right. And it's like, it's the, the label is that they're, you know, it's a, it's like a, a problem child or a gangster who, who ends up in that. Right. And that's, again, I'm just talking about the, the stereotype, not the reality. Help, help. I'd love to hear how do you go from 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 a healthy place to to, to the worst case scenario, and, and I'm talking about an example like the executive that you talked about, because that's going to sure. really uh, lay it out to people that this isn't this isn't like a street problem. Sure, absolutely. So, so just starting with uh, the first question, just in terms of race and the cocaine crack epidemic, and kind of that, and then eventually the opioid epidemic. You know, the war on drugs started in the early 80s, and it was really not a war on drug dealers and drug pushers, really a war on drug addicts. The majority of people who were victims of the war on drugs were people that were suffering from the disease of addiction and needed treatment. And, you know, there was the Anti-Drug Abuse Act in the mid-80s, which basically created these disparities between a punishments between cocaine and crack cocaine that's right so the same amount of cocaine i'm sorry so the same penalty was given for crack cocaine as was a hundred times the amount of powder cocaine and crack cocaine is just more prevalent in black communities that's right and so this went on and all we've seen happen in the last 20 to 30 years is an explosion in pe- in the incarceration rates. So from the 80s, we had like 300,000 people incar- incarcerated. Fast forward 20 years later, it's like 2 million people. Fast forward another 20 years later, and it's continuing to grow. That's right. And so there's certainly this issue of punishing addiction just doesn't work. It just doesn't. And then finally, uh, Obama put in place the Fair Sentencing Act, which kind of then leveled this uh, again. So it, it kind of undid all of this, uh, these disparities between co- cocaine and crack cocaine, which, by the way, when we look at the statistics, it, it, it proved true. More black people were incarcerated due to this, uh, due to this uh, act than than people of uh, other races. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that in the medical community and in America and in in other areas as well, we've taken the approach of dealing with addiction in the past as, as, as a, as a crime, as a moral deficiency, as a lack of willpower that should be punished Mm -hmm. instead of a psychological issue as instead of a a disease issue instead of a spiritual issue that requires treatment and help help and care and compassion and so uh what we found is punishing addiction just doesn't work because all we've ended up with with more people in prisons less people in treatment and and this is the most important part drug overdose deaths that have reached such alarming rates it's just horrific so even our last numbers in 2019 so drug overdose deaths have continuously increased each year and in 2019 we've which are our latest numbers basically we've we've 
broken records again. So we've reached a new peak of drug overdose deaths. And it's surpassed deaths, HIV deaths at the peak of their epidemic, car crash deaths at the peak of its epidemic, gun deaths at the peak of its epidemic. More people are dying yearly than have died in the Vietnam War. So we're really seeing numbers that are, are frightening. And the, the opioid epidemic was declared a public health emergency three years back. And we are still seeing increases. So, so we're doing things that are working. We just need to do more of them. So, so, so that's to kind of talk a little bit uh, on that first question. But to, to the question of how do we see like high functioning uh, people from higher socioeconomic statuses lead into addiction. A good example is the opioid epidemic. So we're seeing people who were prescribed opioids. This is a common story yeah. for some sort of injury or some sort of chronic pain complaint. And they were slowly increased on those opioids because the issue with opioids is when you start on opioids for a pain complaint, your body will become tolerant to that opioid, just like your body adapts to anything. When I go into a dark room, my pupils will dilate to bring in more light. When I go into a, a bright room, my pupils will constrict to bring in less light. Our bodies are constantly adapting to external stimuli. Same thing with opioids. When we use opioids on a regular basis, uh, basis opioid painkillers on a regular basis, our bodies adapt to that and they start adapting to that. And just like the pupil, it'll, the body will start to make adaptations to bring in more pain because pain is an important, a, a important thing. It, it tells us how to avoid things that are not good for our body. And that's why we see people with diabetes, they lose sensations in their feet and then they step on something or, but they don't feel it. And then yeah. small injury turns into an infection and then they lose their foot. And so pain is important and our body will react to that by adapting to pain and by turning up the pain volume. So back to the example, somebody gets put on opioids and for a pain complaint, their body starts turning the volume up on pain. Their body becomes tolerant on it. So what does the doctor do? Says, oh, your pain's getting worse. Patient says, my pain is getting worse. Opioids go up. And this cycle continuously repeats itself until this person is now on really high doses of opioids, which you can still overdose uh, if you're on high doses of opioids prescribed by a doctor. And, and what we're seeing now is with the opioid epidemic, there's all types of ways physicians are being pressured to abruptly stop people from opioids. So whether that be institution-specific pressures that are being placed on physicians, or that's federal reg, uh, you know, laws and state laws and national initiatives, and then also just sort of people worrying about the reputational impact of one of their patients having an adverse event on opioids and then it becoming a public issue. So there's all types of pressures of why patients are being abruptly stopped from opioids from their doctor. <laughs> So I actually had kind of two uh, related questions to the points you just made, and thank you for addressing them the way you just did. I, I think you're really, um, I mean, you're very lucid. I, I, know we'll, I know we'll talk about this a little later, but you're, you're, uh -huh. uh, you have a way of sort of succinctly, I think, sort of capturing uh, information that uh, a lot of people don't really know a lot about. But I mean, and on that note, when you talk about crack cocaine or when you talk about white powder cocaine, I, I think people can automatically, uh, I mean, th there's a uh, ability to understand what you're talking about. Um, but when you talk about opioids, uh, I think that's such a uh, sort of a uh, uh, nebulous kind of term or it, it, because it covers a, a sort of a broad swath of, 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 uh, of pharmaceutical and other type of uh I guess, drugs. Um, so maybe could you define when we talk about opioids, what are we referring to? So, so well, what are some sort of some common names? I mean, I know one like Oxycontin, right? Well, a continent was yeah. one, but, but, but if you can maybe kind of talk about the kind of family of, of, of drugs, if you will, that we're talking about. 
Absolutely. So uh, opioid is any drug that hits the opioid receptor. And opioids are oxycodone, oxycontin, norco, Vicodin, morphine, hydrocodone, hydromorphone. Those are your prescribed opioids. And then you have your illicit opioids, which are heroin. Mm. And fentanyl is the new buzzword. Fentanyl is yeah. a prescribed opioid. But the fentanyl that we're seeing that's driving the opioid epidemic now is not a prescribed form of fentanyl. It's a powdered form of fentanyl that's being created in laboratories by you know, amateur chemists and people were not, you know, being regulated by the FDA. So, so, um, so that's what we're talking about with the, op- and the interesting part with the opioid epidemic, it really captures these three categories really well. So the opioid epidemic, initially the first wave was based on copious prescribing by, by doctors that kind of prompted that. And we'll see that prescription opioids really took off prescription opioid deaths the second wave was with heroin which was thought to be due to transitions of people going from prescription opioids to heroin and then also just heroin deaths increasing because just like the example i mentioned before people being abruptly taken off of opioids now they're in pain when you're in pain what are you going to do you're going to look for opioids to treat that pain. If the doctor's not giving it to you, you're going to find it from other sources. And so, so that's the heroin uh, second wave. Now, the third wave, which is an incredibly dangerous wave, is the fentanyl wave. Because fentanyl is not just the powder form of fentanyl that we're finding on the streets. It's being placed in everything. Yeah, It's being placed in counterfeit opioid tablets. So, like tablets that look like oxycodone but really have fentanyl in it so we do this i do this lecture with the medical students and the residents and even physicians where they're looking where we play this game of find the fake opioid tablet uh and they're indistinguishable the fake ones are indistinguishable from the real one and nobody can figure out i can't tell the difference because they look the same and so people are, are are taking these opioids and they're thinking that it's just, oh, a prescription opioid from a friend, family member, or just some other diverted source, and it's fine, but they take it, and there's actually fentanyl in it. Fentanyl is also being placed in things that don't make sense, like cocaine and meth, because cocaine and meth are uppers, and opioids are downers. So you would think with an upper, you would put another upper to potentiate the effect, but fentanyl is being found in meth. In cocaine, in benzos, in, in all types of substances. And it's just being found in heroin. The point being is it's being found in places and customers are unaware that they're buying fentanyl. And that's really what's driving the deaths. Close to half of the deaths from last year were from fentanyl. And so we're, we're finding these people that are abruptly stopped from opioids and they're going to their friend's family to get these opioid tablets and they don't know that they're actually getting fentanyl and they're having overdose death. So because it's essentially like a Pandora's box that the initial prescription may, may open if it continues, goes on long enough or, or gets increased long enough. And then you mentioned heroin and fentanyl, potentially, I presume alcohol could be a replacement, uh, other like more accessible drugs. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe you could talk a little about that alcoholism coming from the initial, you know, the, the opioid use that gets taken away from the doctor or, and, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on marijuana too. Like, does that, is that, do you consider that a, a, a dangerous, like, is there a danger to that? Or now that it's legal, is it something that we can just relax about and I, say, oh, it's all good? I think, uh, yeah, I really want to, I definitely want to have a conversation around marijuana, one, because of the legalization um, uh, and, and just the uh, uh, sort of um, kind of ubiquity in terms of that particular drug. Um, but I guess, yeah, to Omar's point, maybe talking a little bit about, um, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of process that a addict will, will generally go through it, it, like assuming that they're beginning with one of these three, like, like you said, you've got the, uh, uh, what begins as a prescription, uh, in the first case, in the second case, you're seeing, like you said, the, the, the kind of increases of heroin use and then finally, uh, fentanyl. Um, but, and to that first point in terms of prescription use, um, you know, I, I would recommend listeners, uh, there, there's actually a, a great, I think it was a two-parter segment that um, 
uh, John Oliver's show, uh, HBO show, did on uh, on, the, on the opioid crisis. And and one of the things he talks about is the role that big pharma played, at least initially, um, you know, in terms of the outbreak, uh, in terms of the pressures that it was placing on doctors to actually prescribe these drugs to begin with. Yeah, I just want to just exactly like piggybacking off the the, the whole idea of the the the, the process, like Perez is asking about. Like what happens? The doctor says, "Sorry, I'm not giving you any more." Right at that point, there you're at a you're at a junction. Right, you could either stop, or find something illegal, or find something legal, mm -hmm. or break down. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what I'm really curious about: is what happens at that moment, and and how? What are the safe, safe, good, good alternatives? Good, good things that could happen. And what's like the, the, the dangerous, right? You know? And on and on that same note, again, like going back to the question of like sort of now that the medical community itself is responding to this, like what complicit, you know, like was there some you know level of um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like how how complicit was the medical community itself in terms of sort of exacerbating this problem because of the pressures? Um, you know, uh, either implicitly or explicitly to prescribe these drugs to begin with. Absolutely. So pharmaceutical co companies are under a lot of uh, fire and there's a lot of lawsuits uh, yeah. being waged against pharmaceutical companies specifically because of the methods they, they use to market and advertise and push these opioids. They start to look like tactics that a drug dealer would use. That's In right. other words, yeah. pharmaceutical companies are under fire because of the way that the risks of opioids were minimized. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not necessarily solely the fault of the pharmaceutical companies. There's a lot of factors at play of prompting and precipitating the opioid epidemic. Sure. There's just it was a, a lack of information that doctors had initially. There was really poor data that we were operating out of that reassured us that opioids were safe mm -hmm. and not as addictive as we th as we would have intuitively thought maybe 20, 30 years ago. And uh, th so there's certainly a push for that. And, uh, and also, uh, the methods pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies use to target doctors to get opioids out in the community were not fair and not safe and not ethical. And so that's why we're seeing a lot of these lawsuits win. And, um, uh, you know, I think that's going to be important to bring that's right. uh, balance back to this. Now, yeah. It, it, it very much harkens back to the sort of tobacco industry, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it was only when you had like sort of the big litigation that took place um, that that uh, where that crisis sort of comes to, and obviously it's not something that's concluded, but where awareness increases because, and then you begin to find out about the kinds of marketing tactics, et cetera, that big tobacco was using. And I think uh, we're kind of seeing similar things ha occurring now uh, I think, like you said, because of litigation, um, you know, uh, against some of these big pharmaceutical companies. But I, I kind of liked how you talked about, you know, um, not only the unfair tactics, but, you know, doctors themselves, physicians, then not only being targeted, maybe perhaps, like you said, unfairly, immorally, uh, unethically uh, by these big pharmaceutical companies, but also just the data wasn't there so that doctors could make informed decisions. Um, and in the case of, you know, big pharma, you know, it, it, you know, that data, even if it was available, maybe wasn't being made available to the medical community. Um, if, if pharmaceutical companies were already doing some trials and some studies around this to begin with, just like we saw with the tobacco industry back in the 90s or what have you. Absolutely. Absolutely. You could, you'd see ads for tobacco in medical journals uh, from, from decades ago uh, right. before the link to cancer was made. And then now we have cancer. Uh, so smoking is the number one preventable cause of death. And alcohol, by the way, is the number three preventable cause of death in the U.S. And so 
alcohol and drugs and nicotine and addiction in general is really something that is pervasive and a root cause of many issues. And we'll see people who, you know, by the way, not everybody on opioids has an addiction. I think that's something important to just put out there that we see a lot of people that have pain and have been placed on opioids and opioids help their pain. We also see a lot of people who are on opioids and it's not helpful for their pain. It's complicating their pain, but still not having an addiction. In other words, it's more the withdrawal from the opioids. It's more of the fact that opioids are kind of inducing more sensitivity to pain. That's an issue. And then we'll have a minority of people that are on opioids chronically that develop misuse and addiction. So it's not that opioids, being regularly on opioids, are uh, equivalent to having an addiction. And I'll tell you, as an addiction doctor and addiction consult service, we are seeing a lot of patients where we're asked to evaluate somebody on opioids uh, where it looks kind of strange. There's some red flags there. And we come in and we say, we do an evaluation. We talk to them. We talk to their family members. We talk to their outpatient doctors. And we say, this person is not currently meeting criteria for addiction and just needs um, more monitoring, more safe opioid prescribing, and some alternatives to pain other than opioids. And there's a whole bunch of alternatives to pain. What, what I do with Lucid Lane is, is that we create, we're creating clinical programs that are addressing the opioid epidemic. So prevention of the opioid epidemic, we're working with surgeons and surgery centers to promote monitoring of opioids. And so, yeah, talk, talk a little, that. give us the background on, on Lucid Lane. Well, I, I feel like we mentioned, it. sorry, I, I don't mean to keep kind of putting in like like putting a pin in the conversation because I want to keep track of all these pins in these conversations. But I, I wanted to make sure like Omar, you asked I think a very poignant question. I wanted to make sure that we address that. Um you know going back to the idea of the process, right? Like 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 take us through the tra the trajectory of I mean we understand Got it. I think for the most part, the, tr the trajectory of someone, you know, who comes in, you know, they're involved in a car accident, they need a painkiller, they are put on these prescription opioids because of to to manage pain. Um, how do you go from that to heroin? How do you go from, you know, and, and maybe that's a very different trajectory than someone whose very gateway into opioids is heroin addiction. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, maybe so talk a little bit about these kind of disparate sure. kind of and, and yeah, yeah, and the legal and the legal, not just heroin, but like the uh, the legal. Well, that's what I mean, right? More accessible yeah. pathways, right? The Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so what we find is that when p people will, who develop an addiction will enter into their drug and alcohol use for several different reasons. Some people enter into drug and alcohol use because it's normative in their peer group growing up or their family. It's just part of what they do. Maybe for some people, it's a rite of passage. Other people may enter into drug and alcohol use because of pre-existing mental health issues and challenges. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's issues related to their personality. Maybe it's depression. And they're using substances as a way to regulate their emotions. Other people, it's trauma. It could be sexual abuse. It could be other forms of trauma, which they use drugs and alcohol in order to deal with the trauma related to that. And whatever reason they enter into using drugs and alcohol for, after a period of using drugs and alcohol and to, to deal with those issues, they develop two issues now. One is the issue that brought them to using substances. The second is the issue of developing an addiction. An addiction is when there are changes in the way the person is wired, let's say in the brain and just in their wiring, where now they've lost control over their substance use and they continue to use substances compulsively with disregard to the consequences and they have a preoccupation with using drugs and alcohol and they couldn't they have intrusive thoughts 
to use drugs and alcohol and they can't wish it away. And this works with drugs and alcohol. This is also with behavior addictions like gambling, pornography. It all operates the same way in the sense that if you're waking up every day and you're swearing off your substance or your behavior and you, you end up using it, chances are you may have a problem with addiction. If you've developed a really severe consequence, like an ultimatum from a spouse, like if you do use this again, I'm going to leave. Or if you have some other issue, like you have the, a medical consequence that if you continue to use, you're facing more death or some severe medical consequence and you continue to use, chances are you have an addiction. So, so that's any drug, alcohol, or behavior. Now, a good example is opioids. So you'll have somebody who will use opioids consistently and they may have one of those risk factors. Drugs and alcohol, are, are they have access to it or it's normal for them. Uh, they may have mental health challenges. They may have a history of trauma. And so, or they may just have a makeup. It doesn't necessarily have to be those things. I was going to ask. Have a make, makeup that they're just more prone to developing and progressing from just casual or recreational drug and alcohol use towards more of a compulsive and addictive use. Yeah. And so whatever, whatever that makeup is, it doesn't matter if that's the lawyer, the doctor, the academic, the ex high functioning executive, the soccer mom, the, the, uh, um, the, uh, grad student, the, um, and then also it's like the construction worker, the, um, taxi driver it really doesn't matter at that point it's just more those components it just sometimes we see higher rates of mental illness in certain areas sometimes we see drug and alcohol use being more prevalent in certain socioeconomic statuses i'm sorry drug and alcohol use being more accessible or um accepted common, I mean, yeah. accepted yeah exactly accepted in certain communities or certain locations or certain cities so on and so forth and that's why you'll see like uh you go to let's say you go to south africa or you go to another country you they'll have different drugs that they have problems with because access is important and that's why we have an opioid epidemic and another country doesn't they'll have some other epidemic and substances and this is country by country this is state by state this is city by city mm -hmm. some cities will have more of a meth problem some people will have more of an opioid problem some people will have more of an alcohol problem. Well, actually, most, you know, alcohol is kind of more ubiquitous, but that's another story. So then you see it's not necessarily a, 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 an issue of race, religion, culture, class. It's more of an issue of these components, these risk factors adding up in an individual or in a community. So, for example, Muslims, you would say Muslims don't have problems with addiction, these aren't your typical people who have a problem with addiction, American Muslims, you know, but if you look at the risk factors, let's say, for example, cannabis, like it was brought up before. If you look at the risk factors for people using cannabis, you'll say, hmm, that's something that we see amongst Muslims. So then why wouldn't we have that issue? We, why wouldn't we have issues with drugs and alcohol, which, which, by the way, we do, which, by the way, we do. Absolutely. And, and 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 just uh, just a moment, just just to touch on that, we have a, a support group for Muslim families that started up uh, specifically to to address uh, addiction within Muslims. Um, what what I found in my work at Stanford and just in, in general working with addiction communities, we are seeing Muslims that have a problem with substance use and addiction, and then also uh, Sheikh Rami. Unsur, who is also uh, the spiritual leader and an imam at MCC East Bay, and also the founding director at Taiba Foundation, which works with inmates. It, through his work, he also found people approaching him and talking with him as a spiritual leader who had a problem with uh, addiction. So we, we got together and we created a, a free support group for Muslims to treat addiction. And uh, the, the interesting thing about that is what we found is it was most, mostly families coming to us with the problem and not necessarily the, the person themselves who had an addiction coming to us. So the family member would come to us and say, mm, I have a family member that has a problem with addiction. 
we'd say, well, where's the family room? A family room might not necessarily be wanting to kind of come. And so we created an intervention specifically for family members to uh, deal with uh, to deal with addiction. So f by training family members on how to deal with. It. So going back to the risk factors, when you look at the risk factors for, so let's say somebody using cannabis, uh, you look at. So certainly, religion is is a is a protective factor. Having a close relationship with your parents is a protective factor. Monitoring and parents knowing what's going on with their kids is a protective factor. Spending quality time with family is a protective factor. Now, if that if none of that is happening, if none of that is happening, then you're at, it, it could be a, a risk to develop drugs specifically. With cannabis, dr drug problems specifically with cannabis. Now, it does it, those risk factors. It doesn't matter if it's in somebody of another faith, of no faith, a Muslim. If those r uh, risk factors converge in a person or a family, they're going to be at more risk of having substance problems. So, you know, one of the things that we we, we kind of hear in just common parlance like the way people talk is like well i have a, I, I have an addictive personality right like i, I i'm just prone to addiction um it, you know when, when you talk about risk factors i mean first of all is there any kind of medical i guess evidence or background to support the fact that someone if someone were to claim that okay i have an addictive personality or i have a you know a, a predisposition to being getting addicted to things um and, and i've heard the opposite by the way as well which hey i can do this i don't have an addiction oh uh, yeah yeah good point so so we, i think when you talk about risk factors beyond the sort of socioeconomic you know what are some sort of risk factors that individuals themselves may be predisposition to um, I, I know that genetics can play an issue, right? In terms of like, if you have addiction in your family, we often hear about that being relevant in uh, issues around alcohol abuse. Like if you come, you know, right. So anyway, if you could, t if you could talk a little bit about those risk factors in particular on an individual level. Absolutely. So genetic factors do play a part. If you have a parent that has a alcohol addiction, then we find that in the studies that children have a higher chance of developing an addiction as well. That's not to say that they're like the, a Manchurian candidate that they go through their life and at age 40, all of a sudden they're awakened by some message that they, a beer ad that they see on television and then right. they start drinking. It's more so that they still have to drink and they may develop a pattern, an unhealthy pattern of drinking if they drink. Um, so what we find is that some people will use substances and it'll experiment and then they might grow out of it or they might have another grounding event happen, like they go to work or school and then they just kind of move on from it. Others will have a problem with drugs and alcohol. They'll continue to use it and they'll escalate their drug and alcohol use and then it gets out of hand because after a prolonged period of exposure, it changes the brain there's well-established brain imaging changes that are repeatable reproducible and well-established and documented with people with addiction and so you'll have people that will have those risk factors that will like that that, that are more likely to develop an addiction so the risk factors that i mentioned before like a, a pre-existing history of mental health now drugs and alcohol themselves will induce mental health problems so you have people that have a history of anxiety and depression or maybe a history of trauma or just have more of an impulsive personality um, impulsive and compulsive personality or some other issue that predisposes them to having a drug and alcohol problem and then they use drugs and alcohol and then it's it just kind of a cycle a vicious cycle from there but then you also have drugs and alcohol themselves Let's say somebody doesn't have a pre-existing any of that drugs and alcohol because they just throw off the balance of your brain chemistry will induce anxiety, depression, and then you use more drugs to deal with the anxiety. Drugs and alcohol put you in situations that will put you at risk of traumatic situations. Just the mm -hmm. with with you know with the situation uh, of being on drugs and alcohol, making poor decisions, being in dangerous environments. 
so on and so forth. So, you, so there are those risk factors that lead to people using drugs and alcohol. Namely, uh, you have mental health, you have uh, access to drugs and alcohol, um, you have uh, people that cultural expectations of, of drugs and alcohol. A lot of it is related to your peer group as well. So if you, if you, if you look at children or youth or emerging adults, young adults, uh, a lot of risk factors are around people's peer groups and support groups. And so people who have peers that are using drugs and alcohol are at a much higher risk of develop using drugs and alcohol themselves and also developing that into an addiction as well. So is, is, is marijuana a risk factor? And, and the reason I'm yeah. asking that is because that's a good way to assess kind of the, the health, the, the 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 you know the goodness of of marijuana right because right now I'm I'm in Washington State and which is like leading edge of marijuana use in the U S and making it legalization you drive down the main street here and you see billboards galore and um, and we're here in California and, and as a Democrat you're kind of like asked to be pro, you know legal pro, legalization in a sense it's kind of like um, you know that's kind of the the on 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 the on the Democratic um, you know, platform. side of things. Yeah, platform exactly. Um, so, you're, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. Like, is marijuana uh, a risk factor? And, and what's as a, as a professional, as a Muslim, what's your, what's your take on marijuana in terms of the, the risk there? So, I, I, I don't smoke marijuana on Juma, but on other, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Nice. in Ramadan. In Ramadan right? <laughs> I'm joking, but uh, I, I don't smoke marijuana. But um, um, so, so there's two camps with cannabis. So the first camp is the gateway, gateway hypothesis. Yeah. Cannabis is a substance that will lead to other substances, and it will trigger something that will make you more prone to use harder substances, the gateway drug. The other camp is that there are pre-existing risk, risk factors that exist that really make people prone to using drugs. And cannabis just happens to be the more accessible, more um, acceptable substance. So that generally be is the first one that people will try. And then that will initiate or open the door to other substances. Mm -hmm. Really, the important factor here is that, is it the cannabis that does something, or is there something that precedes the cannabis that's the issue that we should focus on? And th those are certainly the, the risk factors that, that we talk about. And, you know, a lot of the conversation is around around cannabis and the legalization of cannabis is around if it has some medical value to it, or if it is um, something that's safe, uh, and if it's something that's a, an individual right that people should have the right to be able to choose if they want to use cannabis or not. Certainly from the perspective of, again, going back to punishing addiction and punishing drug crimes, I think there's some value to reassessing how severely we punish drugs in general, including cannabis, as opposed to providing treatment and other options to help people re rehabilitate themselves. Now there's cannabis, the cannabis plant, and then there's many chemicals that exist within the chemical plant. So there's THC, which is the chemical that gets you high. And then there's CBD that is more of a natural chemical, I'm sorry, not more of a natural chemical. It is a natural chemical that's also found in cannabis. And CBD, pure CBD, shouldn't, shouldn't get you high. Um, and so there is some suggestion of medical value, uh, but there just needs to be more studies. It's, it's in the infancy. Right. And we have no. to remember with tobacco with opioid when we made fast decisions in the infancy of these substances, we're dealing with significant population level damage because we made too fast assumptions and conclusions based on these cannabis. And so CBD, 
specifically is being studied heavily for things like epilepsy, Parkinson's, and other uh, disorders. And the only thing that's been FDA approved is CBD for epilepsy. Everything else is in the works. So it's, it's, it's really, we, we really have to reserve judgment and allow the scientists to do their research. And when that, when we get conclusions, if there's a chemical out there that can help people and it's better than other chemicals that we have out there that are helping people now, then I think it's important for us to, to consider those chemicals. Now, uh, for, for chemicals that intoxicate you, then it's a risks versus benefits discussion. If mm -hmm. there's some real value in helping conditions that people are suffering with, like epilepsy and really severe pain or really severe chemotherapy-induced issues and spasticity, then yeah, well, you know, C using CBD or using other chemicals and taking it from the perspective of risks versus benefits is important. We can't just rule things out because cannabis has a bad reputation. But at the same time, we can't rush to conclusions because we can really be in a dangerous spot five, 10 years from now. And the, 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 we need to respect the process and give time for the process to happen because there also is this craze for CBD and cannabis being this thing that's going to save or help all types of conditions that are just not scientifically proven. And the last thing I'll say is, I think what's important to, to recognize about this is that there's a thing called the placebo effect. So the placebo effect if there, is when somebody has a belief about a chemical and because of their belief of that chemical working, they'll perceive that as it working, or maybe it may resolve that issue. Now, that might just be that time resolved that issue or some other factor. So there's one study that looked at people with asthma who used an, a placebo inhaler, a fake inhaler. It didn't have any medical value to it. And they found that on breathing tests, objectively, it, it didn't do anything. But patients perceived benefit from it, they, they, they felt a perceived benefit from it. So because they took something and they had an expectation that it may help and a belief in it, and they felt that it, it provided them some relief. So I think that CBD has this sort of novelty aspect to it. It has some glamour to it. It's a somewhat of a fad. And for desperate or vulnerable people, they might use something like this to help. And, you know, if it didn't have any harms, what's the point? Who, who, who cares? Mm -hmm. But we are finding that CBD does interact with some medications. So the frustrating thing for doctors is that if I have you on a medication that's shown to be effective and you're out there using some herbal medication or CBD that's interfering with the medication I'm giving you that might be necessary for your survival, you know, that, that's, that's really frustrating to, to, to have to approach. But we, I mean, it's understandable and we should be met with compassion and education, uh, but very frustrating. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm holding on to the word you said of what's the preceding event, right? It's almost like what's the motivation for someone to dabble in, cannabis i think that's right are they a college student just trying to have fun or are they some or are they some 30 year old who's can't you know can't can't deal with some issue that needs to be dealt with like maybe a mental health issue or or, or what have Stretch. you and they're using it as a band-aid right yeah so, so i think i think addressing the root cause and looking at what was the procedure that that definitely resonated and um kind of just in the interest of time, I do. I do want to kind of well talk about. Why don't, why don't, yeah, I mean, I, I, Amir, if you could like maybe address that part of it, and then I, yeah, we, we will just kind of take the conversation um, and, and talk about some of the issues that we sort of put pins in earlier. So we'll come back to those. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly like the mental health yeah. and, and 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 actually this and even suicide, right? Uh, and then we yeah exactly just kind of transitioning to those two points. Yeah. 
So, so yeah, so there's definitely risk factors for, for using cannabis and for developing a problem with cannabis. So for example, in young adults, parental expectations is one. So people who have children that are more involved in U.S. culture than their parents. Um, also availability of educational materials uh, and also relationships with parents and family, religious involvement, involvement in terms of spirituality. All of those are protective factors or risk factors. And so it, those are important to know so that we can, if we don't have that going on with our families and our kids and our communities, naturally that we create that artificially through inserting that into our families, working on our relationships with our kids and our spouses and our parents, and also creating prevention programs within our communities. There's a really great model in Iceland where they just took all the protective and protective factors and they minimized all the risk factors that we've been discussing. And they created that into a program, like an after-school program, so um, which focused on increasing relationships with family members and, and optimizing those risk factors and, and decreasing those protective factors. I'm sorry, increasing the protective factors, reducing the risk factors. And then also, yes, dealing with your trauma in healthy ways, seeking mental health treatment, talking to a therapist, processing it, giving yourself a break, giving yourself a break in seeking help. And then for mental health, dealing with your mental health, uh, anxiety, depression, there are medications out there. There are therapies out there. There is people that may have milder formers, forms of anxiety and depression and may not feel comfortable going to a therapist who could just benefit from some wellness and working on wellness and 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 and, and um, taking care of their mental health and their physical health. Specifically with COVID now, everybody's sort of affected with stress and anxiety. Um, there was a what are you seeing? Yeah, like I mean, like kind of in this kind of age of COVID now, like as a as a. Uh, uh, medical professional uh, dealing specifically with addiction, um, and I guess more broadly with people coming to you who are uh, addicted or are facing uh, addiction due to some underlying uh, mental health issue. Um, what, are you seeing kind of an exacerbation in particular areas um, in the age of COVID? And presu presumably, these things compound, right? Because you have the economic stress. Right. You have the social iso social isolation. Yeah, I'm sort of people can't all go to, together as yeah. an aggregate of the you know when exactly. I say the age of COVID. Yeah, <laughs> right, lockdowns. Right. Uh, and, you know, not to mention anxiety and depression. You, that, can, you can't. Yeah, you can't go to your church or your mosque. You can't go see your your therapist in person if you have maybe a family medical right. issue. It's, it's uh, maybe you have a medical issue that's causing pain that's being kicked down. In you know, the can is getting kicked down the road because. You know, you don't. You're hesitant to even go into a hospital or anxiety and so on and so well, forth. Well, for a while there, you couldn't go to for even elective options, right? I mean, uh, the hospitals and doctors' offices were closed for the for earlier part of the uh, lockdowns. For a lot of people, they didn't have access to elective procedures and being able to even just go to their doctor. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, I, I guess you know, specifically talking about that within kind of where you know where we find ourselves today. Absolutely. Yeah. So the past few months. Yeah. There's so many factors that are leading to the increase in mental health challenges and the decrease in mental health outcomes that we're seeing, increase in substance use, increase in addiction uh, severity that we're seeing. And it all revolves around, you know, what's well comprehensively put as the age of COVID, everything we're all dealing with. So isolation, you know, sheltering in place. Some of our patients, some of our people are dealing with isolation. Now they're at home more with toxic environments. Uh, and then stress from, from that as well as unemployment. Unemployment rates are high. Uh, so financial stress that comes with that, but also just having more time and that being unstructured time. And that's very stressful as well for many of my patients and many people that I'm seeing. And you couple that with a decrease in support, decrease in just 
family support, social support, being able to see your friends. And for people that were previously engaged in therapy, decreased in group therapy, individual therapy, as we're all trying to migrate to online forms of support. We have many people that were going to 12-step meetings previously that are no longer able to go to their 12-step meetings in person. And now we're having to find online substitutes for that. So yeah, I think the age of COVID, I think the problem, the stress, the anxiety, the depression is all sort of really well understood among pe amongst people as to why that's happening. Uh, but I think what may be less understood is for some people, they just may not know that it's happening to them. So for many people, they're at more at risk of dealing with the mental health consequences and the wellness consequences of COVID as opposed to the infection of COVID. And so uh, there are a lot of things people can look out for that they may not necessarily intuitively feel or identify as anxiety or depression or mental health issue or challenge. And that could just be simply signs of just feeling more irritable or labile <laughs> or more mood swings, more fear, anger, more feeling down or worried. Um, and this could also manifest in our behavior and not just our emotions. So changes in our appetite to so eating more or eating less, low, less appetite, decreases in energy, just not being able to perform the way we used to perform and our activity levels, difficulty in concentrating at work. So and conversely, uh, sleeping, like I, I'm finding just on a personal anecdotal level, uh, I've never su suffered bouts of insomnia like I have in the past few past few weeks and months. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sleep is a huge one. Okay. Yeah. Everything you're saying leads me to think that just um, at the individual level, forget, I'm not talking at the cl clinical level, just bringing some compassion to those around you. And right, because there's we're probably even people in your, whether it's your household or your circle, are probably feeling this you may not know it and if you bring some of that compassion uh you know to the situation <laughs> if anything it might help a bit definitely won't work to make the situation worse right absolutely i think we're all feeling it to some degree and i, I think that there are some people who will feel it more than others people who have pre-existing mental health challenges younger adults so C cdc put out an interesting study recently um younger adults yeah minorities essential workers, uh, caregivers, adult caregivers are experiencing disproportionate worse mental health outcomes. Also increased substance use because when you use substances to cope or chemicals to cope, that's going to increase when there's more coping needed. And then also what they found was elevated suicidal ideation. So there may be certain people that are more at risk not to diminish or minimize other groups that are outside of these mentioned groups uh, but to also recognize that if you are part of these groups you may need to have a little bit more vigilance in monitoring of your own mental emotional state and then there's you know recommendations that are just given generally to everyone some of them sound intuitive but are worth reminding people about and, and, and mentioning please, like, ta please. like taking care of your body, taking care of your eating well. Uh, so well-balanced meals, exercising, exercising can't be overemphasized in the sense that usually exercise is looked at as taking care of your heart health or your lung health or building muscle mass or looking a certain way. But it's, it can't be overemphasized how important exercise is for your mental health, mm -hmm. the effects that it has on your brain and producing those feel-good chemicals. And, you know, there are, there are things you can do to take care of your body that would result in benefit over maybe a longer term, maybe days or maybe weeks. But exercise is something you can do immediately and get benefits from immediately you don't have we don't have to jump into all or nothing and do 30 minutes a day an hour a day even simple exercises simple aerobic respiratory uh, exercises and stretching exercises 
and isometric exercises have been shown to be helpful, just contracting exercises. And then also connecting with others, so taking time to connect with others, although that might have been organically and naturally placed in our life rhythm previous to COVID. Now we got to like make time for that. That's right. You got to schedule your you you Zoom schedule calls. At, 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 Zoom call. <laughs> yeah. And just an- anecdotally, one thing I've been with, like has been my save- savior is uh, without access to a gym, I do, I try to step outside every day for uh, 10,000 steps. Wonderful. And, and usually what I do, um, I started out, listening to podcasts <laughs> and I, I say this a while we're on a podcast but over the over a course of months i found that starting to get counterproductive with just because it's all negative news or like you know what, what what alarmist type situation of course not this podcast <laughs> but uh, npr just even even new news and politics and that sort of thing uh, stress stress uh, causing stress but you know hey you can walk and, and kill two birds with one stone catch up with somebody you haven't caught up with or listen to some spiritual content or what have you. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, uh, uh, and Amr, I'd love for you to talk about that as well, because like, like you were going through this list of things that people can, can, can like, I think can do, um, but uh, th- perhaps something that people should avoid is mm. because of this, because of the free time that we have now um, and, and moments of isolation, people are, spending more time on social media, on consuming news, on consuming, you know, just the content that's out there. Um, but that certainly can keep, can keep people, can keep one informed, but it also certainly has negative consequences as well. Yes, there's social distancing and then there's social media distancing as well. Thank you. So, Thank so, you. <laughs> so a lot of people, so yeah, there's a lot of, you know, staying informed is important and helpful in reducing anxiety on situations when there's acute and regular changes, but also if people are finding that they are compulsively watching the news or, you know, it's not constructive, there's low yield information, but they're finding that it's affecting their mental health and how they feel and making them less productive or more preoccupied, uh, then it's a good idea to take a break and to Mm -hmm. stay away from that and to make sure that we're staying balanced and then also yeah continuous kind of continuously being on now so we have people that are like sheltered at home working at home you know there's no commute there's no walk there's no sort of natural breaks in the rhythm of transitioning from home to work to you know friends to family it's all like one conscious a one constant stream of being on so you're waking up work starts right away for many people if they're sheltering at home and online then it's you know right after work it's like family because family's basically right next door and then it's jumping on to a zoom call and you're with friends so it's 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 important to also take breaks and schedule the unwind and schedule the, the the unwinding. And I think it's important to recognize that there may be a larger lesson or wisdom behind all of this and just being able to in, create more resilience within us as a people and learning how to to do this so that when COVID passes and we've learned all these new tools of learning how to more well uh, more balance our, uh, more optimally balance ourselves, create stronger coping mechanisms that we can take our lives to another level. Because right now, it's also a great opportunity to re-examine what's important to us, That's take right. a break from what's going on, and then strengthen our coping skills muscle. And when COVID passes, take all of this and improve our lives and exactly Um, more peaceful people the often heard refrain through these past few months has been you know a return to normalcy and and perhaps a return to the way things were isn't an ideal that we should aspire towards right especially for those of us either in toxic relationships or dealing with mental health issues or right or just not living um uh a, a a healthy lifestyle or a lifestyle of well-being, that a return to normalcy is the last thing you want. And you want to be able to, like you said, learn from the tools that you've developed 
or had to develop in these past few months. Um, so thank you for those points as well, Amr. And, and just to kind of echo what's already been stated, I mean, you know, we're living through this sort of global pandemic, a communicable disease, a disease that is spread, um, you know, through uh, interaction or close interaction with people who are infected. But at the same time, you know, the risk factors associated with people who uh, either have comorbidities, whether that's heart disease, uh, being obese, overweight, poor eating habits, a low immune system, etc., only exacerbating the kind of things that we're seeing with COVID, uh, certainly with related to mortality rates. Um, you know, it, it, it almost defies, it, it, it seems uh, counter, yeah, like it, 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 the, the height of irrationality not to take care of ourselves physically, right? Not to boost our immune systems. Um, and the way you do that is again, diet, exercise, mental well being, you know, eating properly and so on. Um, I, I, I want, if you could, and I know I want to be mindful of the time. So there's probably two or three quick points that we, I want to touch on before we let you go. One, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about addiction and, and, and we've kind of, we, 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 we've, we've, talked about some of the lifestyle things. Um, so on a broader level, when we talk about addiction, um, and, and maybe this isn't related to your particular area of practice, but I would love for you to comment on it is what about, you know, because when we talk about addiction, we're not just talking about being addicted to substances, right? We're also talking about being addicted to behavior. Um, and so you, you know, you hear about sex addiction or, um, you know, pornography addiction or addiction to overeating. Um, you know, one, do you, do you deal with that on a professional level? And if not specifically, um, you know, maybe kind of talk about where the medical community is around those issues, sort of non-substance related addiction. So the, so absolutely pornography, sex addiction, food addiction, and gambling addiction, when conceptualized as an addiction for people who haven't been able to get traction on these problems, can be helpful to meet it with the gravity and level of treatment that it needs for them to just deal with it and move on. So what we find is that people with... Sorry, just quick, I guess from a medical point of view, like I've heard studies, for example, as it relates to, you know, one of my pet projects or pet passions is about just what we eat and how we eat and things like that. But like sugar, sh like sugar and food and just the way our body physiologically reacts to sugar consumption being very similar to what happens to our bodies when we take, you know, uh, uh, substances, illegal substances or illegal substances, neurotics. Yeah, absolutely. Narcotics, so excuse me. I said neurotics, narcotics. <laughs> Narcotics. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, not neurotic people. They're, they're fine. Absolutely. So there's a lot of study done on animal models and with humans who, uh, in terms of sugar consumption and its effect on the brain, it mirrors the same work that's being done with drug addiction on laboratory animals and also humans. And so we are seeing that there are some similar features and the way that we've conceptualized food has changed. It's no longer food that we're eating from the ground. It's more so revolving around salt, sugar, and fat and being created in a laboratory as opposed to a farm and being targeted to create the most pleasurable sensation and chemical rush in your brain as possible to bring you back to more food. And so there's definitely some value in recognizing it more as a strong habit as opposed to a uh, uh, something else. And there are groups and therapy um, approaches out there that conceptualize food as an addiction and treating it with the same things that an addiction or a mental health problem would deal with. And when people engage in those, they have better outcomes. For example, there's CBT apps like Noom, which really focus on the psychology of eating as opposed to just the ha just it being something that we need to enforce a, a diet on and increase exercise on uh, and, and for it to resolve. But really looking at beyond the acute stage of losing the weight, maintaining that gain and changing the habits, thought patterns, 
emotions around our relationship with food. And that goes for pornography, gambling, and other behavioral issues as well. With the behavioral addictions, it takes a while for that to be able to be blessed by the medical scientific community, just not because there's no validity validity in it, because of the way that the game works. So, for example, mm-hmm. gambling addiction, for many years, decades, we knew that this has is an addiction and it was treated as an addiction but it was only recently recognized by uh, uh, by you know the world health organization and other uh, other um, national organizations as being an addiction and so if we wait for the uh, th- this to really bless it, it's going to take a while right. for us. So to conventional really- wisdom in the medical community, if we wait for that to happen. Not necessarily conventional wisdom. I think in the medical community, in uh, you know mental health community, and okay. even in the research community, there is a lot of weight on there being treatments out there for these behavioral addictions. Got it. Uh, it's just about formalizing it and canonizing it. And, uh, and, and certainly, you know, gambling addiction has been formalized. Pornography addiction, it's harder to test and, and uh, study. And sex addiction is harder to test and study. And food addiction, you know, has its own uh, challenges as well. But it's, 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 there's a lot of factors uh, and challenges to, to these behavior addictions being recognized in addiction. Some of them might be cultural some of them might, it might just be the way that we um, view uh, behavioral addictions. Um, like, are we going to call everything addictions now? Um, and uh, how are we going to approach that? Well, certainly certain behaviors act like addictions and respond to the same treatments as addictions and are disrupting people's lives. I mean, the second most preventable cause of death is uh, diet and exercise. So it's not some small issue. It's a, it's a large issue. More people are dying from food problems, diet and extra obesity uh, in America than are dying from under eating or being underweight. So that's something to really keep in mind that right. Malnutrition. It's the opposite problem, right? Right. It's being over nutrition. Right. Right. Whatever the medical, right. Um, if I it, it kind of bring things back full circle, uh, Amir, to where we started, um, you know, which was what brought you to this particular field, um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk specifically about what you see happening in the Muslim community around conversations about addiction. Uh, because in the past, we've had on this show medical health professionals who have talked about the sort of taboo around mental health or, or seeking care for mental health issues in general. Do you find some of those things being the case as well uh, uh, as it relates to addiction? So just kind of your experiences in triaging and dealing with um, issues of addiction and mental health, I guess, more broadly speaking, but within the Muslim community where you know, and maybe maybe my evidence or or where I'm coming from is a little dated in the sense that maybe it isn't so so taboo anymore. But certainly, you know, there was a time where uh, talking, even talking about these issues, um, even seeking treatment, was seen as a taboo. Absolutely. So I think you know, from the perspective of the problem in the American Muslim community, we're seeing the same stories, the same challenges, the same. Um, issues as we're seeing from the broader community. So in terms of addiction, it's identical in terms of the problem, in terms of what I'm seeing. When those risk factors, when those risk factors and those protective factors line up in a way where somebody has a, is more prone to a substance problem, they're going to have that substance problem. The only difference that I'm seeing in the Muslim community is that there, it needs to be there's a there's a need for there to be a more culturally sensitive approach in the sense that there are more barriers to treatment so that the stories are the same 
essentially. But the barriers to treatment are a little bit more complex and there's more of a dynamic. There's more of a compounded shame and stigma. There's shame and stigma around mental health in general and addiction in general. There's more compounded shame and stigma in certain populations. So for example, pregnant populations, we see a lot of more compounded shame and stigma. Now with Muslims, it's similar. We see more compounded shame and stigma in the sense that Muslims feel that by seeking mental health treatment, they've somehow failed or it's somehow a deficiency in their beliefs uh, or, or their iman or their um, it's an admission of a failure or, or somehow a lack of iman is equivalent to them not uh, you know, a depression or anxiety somehow is equivalent to a, a lack of amen. And if they just pray or they uh, just have more reliance, then these things will go away. That's right. Th th There's that's a tendency when you frame it that way to what we call spiritually bypass the issue. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, it certainly uh, those things are important. Prayer, and religious exercises, spiritual exercises, those things are important. Don't want to diminish that at all, but there may be a more complicated solution uh, that there may be need to be an adjunct to those exercises, such as uh, seeing a therapist who has experience in taking people from anxiety and depression to ha dealing and suppressing that or treating that anxiety and depression. Same thing with addiction. And so when we uh, created this Muslim group, uh, this therapy group, it was based on this idea that we were seeing people come to us with seeking help for drugs, alcohol, mental health challenges, and their stories were similar, except the challenges were a little bit more, and the stigma and the shame were a little bit more complicated and needed a little bit more of a targeted explanation uh, to disarm and to get at these core issues. Mm. We created a group. It's a free group. It's open to anybody. You just have to, if anybody's, so we created a, a group specifically for addiction. And the hope is that we create more of these groups for different issues. And the group is a family group because what we saw initially was, it was mostly the families that were motivated so there, there's the addicted loved one, and then there's the family surrounding them that's, you know, being affected significantly by that person's addiction, and they're super motivated to make this person get better, but that loved one isn't necessarily motivated, yeah. and so the family members are dealing with the stress and the mental health issues around that, and so we, we created a group specifically for family members, and it's it's uh, it was a collaboration between MCC, East Bay, uh, the Khalil Center, the um, Muslim Mental Health Lab at Stanford, uh, and we created a group. It's a free online group to using a, a therapy or a training modality called CRAFT. CRAFT is Community Reinforcement and Family Training. CRAFT is a evidence-based intervention or an educational program that has been shown to be effective in helping families deal with the stress, improve their stress and uh, emotional um, suffering during the, the, this, uh, this sort of issue, mm -hmm. but then also been shown to be effective in getting that loved one into treatment and getting the help that they need. So, so, so dealing what with that, what was that acronym again? Community reinforcement and family craft. training craft. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Thank open you. to the group. Anybody's, uh, uh, you know, welcome to join. Uh, I, I, I'll plug the email real quick. You can email Bay area intern at Khalil center.com. Bay area intern is all one word. No spaces at Khalil center, Khalil K H A L I L center. Dot com. Email them if you if you're seeking help. Just let us know you need help, and we'll 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 go from there. And so that's a, a free group every two weeks to help people who are dealing with addiction. Uh, to is really that, uh, is that available to people outside of the Bay Area? I mean, obviously we have yeah. listeners who are beyond. Oh yeah, okay, absolutely. Anybody in America, 
anybody in the U.S. And we have people from all over the U.S. that are joining. Excellent. So that's 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 super helpful. That's one resource. Of resource. Any other resource yeah. that you think is important for, for for people to know about within specifically within the Muslim community? You know, there's Khalil Center that is doing great work as well. So they are offering mental health therapy for uh, the Muslim community specifically. And you, you know, you mentioned Doctor. I'm, I'm sorry. You mentioned Sheikh Rami uh, uh, Ansour and his work with the Taiba Foundation. Um, there is a connection that Sheikh Rami has also with the Khalil Center, correct? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Okay, and then Dr. Rania Wad, who's his wife, is, is one of the people involved at the Khalil Center. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so Khalil Center is another resource, um, and I know that has locations both, I think, here and in Chicago specifically. I mean, just talking about home for, 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 for both of us. Yeah, Khalil, uh, uh, so California and Chicago, and then just kind of all over. I think they yeah. have places in New York and uh, oh. in many different states. I think they're um, in, in many different areas now. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So then, and then there was also, again, going back to the email that you mentioned, Bay area intern at Khalil center.com. Yes. Dot com or dot org. I want to just make sure. Dot com. Okay, great, great. So, so thanks. Thanks so much, Amir, um, for sharing everything and just helping us understand the issue of addiction a, a little more. Hopefully some of the tips you've given and, in terms of uh, how we can address some of these things and, and resources um, will be helpful to, to some of our listeners. I know you're working on not just some of these these uh, projects, uh, you know, your, your projects close to your heart, but you're obviously busy with a, a full-time day job at Stanford. And then you're also doing an, um, a project called Lucid Lane. Just before we wrap, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that as well. Absolutely. So what we're seeing is that stigma is an issue, privacy is an issue, and now with COVID, it just transportation is an issue. So Lucid Lane is a teletherapy company that provides therapy. It's a Silicon Valley startup. It was started by Adnan Asar, who's the CEO and president. And he's a serial entrepreneur who rec- who is a co-founder of Livongo that was recently acquired within the last few weeks for $18.5 billion, one of the largest health acquisitions. Yeah, by, by Teladoc. Yeah, yeah. And he went on to start lucid lane specifically for addressing four groups of people people with general mental health challenges people who are tapering off of opioids and benzodiazepines and people with addiction and then also people who are dealing with pain and are looking for therapy options uh, evidence-based therapy options for pain so lucid lane being a silicon valley startup leverages tech based solutions and provides a comprehensive solution for people who are fallen these for one of these four groups. Um, and it's completely online and completely private. So it c- comes to you in your home uh, online. And uh, I think it's a really great option for the current situation, but also for communities where shame and stigma is the barrier to getting help because it offers an option for people to, from the comfort of their home, from the privacy of their home, deal with and get some relief from their mental health challenges, get some guidance on how to deal with addiction, get some guidance on, I'm on opioids and benzos, I don't have an addiction, but I need help tapering off of these medications so that I can be helpful, healthy and helpful. And there's really not options out there for people trying to taper off of opioids and benzos that are easily accessible. So Lucid Lane is online. It's available all throughout the U.S. We have therapists in about 35 states. Um, you can visit our website, lucidlane.com, and you can talk to uh, you can click on a button and talk to a counselor right away or chat with a counselor. We're really trying to create something that's low threshold, uh, you know, works with stigma and keeps privacy. The old ways of mental health treatment were you got to fit into therapy. And if you're not able to fit into therapy, then you're just dismissed as not being serious about wanting treatment or therapy. The newer ways of mental health in our philosophy is that we need to create solutions that fit into people's lives. 
Yeah. Uh, and stigma exists and it'll always exist. And we need to create solutions that are private, not solutions that require you to show up at a mental health facility and expose yourself. Uh, but all but solutions that you can engage with from the privacy of your room, nobody needs to know, and you can deal with your issues and stress. But for the time being, we have support groups that are free for people at Lucid Lane for addiction treatment, for benzo tapering, opioid tapering, for people who are dealing with pain complaints, and then also generally for mental health, for teachers that are dealing with stress. Uh, of going back to school in this new context. Um, we have free support groups for healthcare workers and COVID, for athletes, for people in pain. So all types of free support groups. So I, I'd urge you to get some help if you're dealing with a mental health problem, either through Lucid Lane, either through a faith-based specific group or organization, or either through some other option. Because, you know, we're all going through a lot of stress and difficulty during this time. And uh, many of us deserve a break and, and, and need some help. So really give yourself a break. So with, yeah, no, thank you. And then, so with Lucid Lane specifically, um, you know, beyond some of the free support groups, um, it, it, I, I imagine there are other therapies uh, available that may have a cost associated with it. Is that generally covered by people's insurance? I mean, can you maybe talk a little bit? Yeah, about absolutely. Yeah. That, Thanks for asking. So yeah, we're, we're covered by commercial insurances, Medicare, and then we also have a, a sliding fee schedule based on people's income. So we also offer that option as well. And then we just have free support groups as well for people who who just either financially, they're, it's not something that's feasible, or they just kind of want one foot in and one foot out and want to maybe join privately with their camera off, with the audio off, and just kind of see what it's about, uh, and 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 get their feet wet. So beyond uh, Adnan, any other colleagues whose name you may want to drop here, uh, in case they're listening or their friends <laughs> and are listening. <laughs> Absolutely, Emma Zafran. He's That's a, right. a really creative, brilliant entrepreneur and doctor. Uh, so he's got both sides: an anesthesiologist specializing in pain. So we have really. He's a co-founder. So we have really great um, leadership that's and a, a really great um, solution as well. So I'd urge you guys to check it out. And that is lucidlane.com? Lucidlane.com, yep. Okay, excellent. And so, um, Amir, um, can people reach out to you directly? Uh, any listeners that may, may, may have further follow-up questions or anything else, anything that you'd want to, where people can reach out to you and contact you? Absolutely. You can always look me up on my Stanford profile page and I'll have contact information for me. So feel free to reach out. Um, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to help, but then also here to pair with anybody that's willing to figure out how we can solve this drug overdose epidemic that we're in. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I want to say before letting you go, uh, uh, it's great to just talk to you in general. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, full disclosure, Amr is a relative, so hopefully I, er I earned some uh, uh, brownie points with the aunties uh, for having Amr <laughs> on the show. Uh, beyond just making for a fascinating conversation, uh, hope to have you back, Amr. And uh, again, you know, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, and uh, making yourself self available. Um, Omar, any concluding thoughts you had? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, obviously, known uh, known Omar outside of work uh, a bit through Uperviz, and and that's why we are so casual and referring to you as Omar uh, instead of Doctor Rahim. That's right. So sorry. Just to explain to the users, no, no disrespect intended. Uh, but absolutely blew my mind in terms of uh, pure your expertise and and um, some of the really productive things you're doing to help. Uh, move the needle in a positive direction for the for the community, Muslim community and community at large. So, uh, thanks so much, and yeah, absolutely, would love to have you back at some point, yeah. maybe maybe uh, post COVID, and see how things have evolved since then. Hopefully, in in, in the in the in the right direction. Yeah, and I, I want to plug also Amir for those we like we've mentioned MCC East Bay. Um, if you actually go to the MCC East Bay website, um, you or actually they have a YouTube channel. 
you can, uh, I think, search Amr's name, but uh, Amr, I think you were involved with a couple of panels through MCC, which they put all of their content online. They're really good about that. So for those of you who enjoyed listening to Amr, can see Amir uh, as part of a panel, uh, or I think a couple of panels that he did uh, with MCC East Bay. Um, and so uh, do, 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 do check those out. Those were excellent conversations I remember listening in. Um, yeah, but uh, just to echo what Omar said, thank you so much, Amir. Thank you, as always, listeners, for uh, you know taking the time listening to the show. Um, do look out for us uh, as we have more content and more shows coming your way. And as always, thank you for listening. Um, last but not least, if I can make one final plug, um, please do visit our Patreon page. You can go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence and you can become a monthly patron. Um, every little bit helps. Um, and in that same vein, please do leave a comment, feedback, review. Um, all of that helps us as well, getting the word out about the show. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done it without you listeners. So thank you as always for joining us. And we look forward to having you on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank you.